Hear Scott say something. Uh, we're uh, here meeting on uh, different effects of the planet. Uh, we are hoping to preserve it for all time. Are we ready? Can you guys introduce yourselves? <laughs> yes. So we know. Oh, this is uh, this is my leader, and I'm the follower. <laughs> Hi there. That's uh, a new introduction. Um, this session is called Science and Spirit, um, a new education paradigm for the 21st century. And we're delighted to be here today in Bozeman, Montana. My name is Bonnie Sechitello Sawyer, and I've lived here for 14 years. And this is my colleague and cohort, Scott Frazier. That's me. <laughs> and I, I'm here with her. Um, we're going to do uh, some of the things that our program deals with uh, our program, and I'll let Bonnie talk a little bit more about it. We we deal with uh, tribal issues with water. Uh, our uh, program is called Native Water, and uh, we travel throughout the, the Missouri Basin right now, and we talk about uh, and talk to and listen to elders and people talk about the water issues on their reservations and in the communities surrounding those reservations. And um, what we wanted to do um, originally was uh, when the program started, uh, a group of people went out and collected um, uh, interviews with elders about you know, their history with water and what they thought were changes and what they thought would be good things for the future for their, their young people. And um, we then developed some ideas uh, about educating the youth with an idea of what we think about as four generations behind us, always considering seven generations in front of us. Uh, and um, with that, I'll turn it over back to Bonnie. She can go in a little bit more. And then what we'd like to do is uh, we'll say a little prayer for uh, the, the, the people coming. It'll give some people some time to get in here and then, um, then we'll do some activities. Do you want to say a few? That sounds good. I'll, I'll say things. a few more things about things. Native Waters. And we're based at Montana State University. Um, we kind of joined forces in 2000 and got this project off the ground. We're primarily funded by the National Science Foundation. And at the root of our work is listening to communities, um, fostering community-driven projects that really help build youth leadership and community leadership around water resources. And as Scott said, it's based on a series of 100 interviews that we did with elders, resource specialists, and educators. And when we are really looking for guidance, we go back to communities and, and spend time listening and trying to figure out what our next steps need to be. And we just, in fact, finished a retreat a couple weeks ago up in Browning and learned a lot about where we need to be focusing time in the future. But a big piece of our whole project is integrating science and culture and doing it in ways that help young people understand who they are, that helps them connect with their traditions and connects with uh, traditional ways of knowing. And so one of the things we were gonna do today is we're actually gonna do a series of activities that integrate um, science and spirit and culture. And we see these as um, introductions to the concept, but certainly while they are inspired from tribal traditions, I believe that they can value across different cultural groups and understanding that this is a mechanism to use regardless of what cultural group or underserved group you're working with or whatever community you're working with because we're all indigenous to a place we all have cultural traditions we all have agreements with each other we all have spiritual values and, and values as that was said this morning come from individuals and community and finding those and tapping into those and then working with them in a subject like science that's really designed to disco discover truth and using different ways of knowing to add to that understanding of what truth is and then finding meaning, we can start to say, these are all the tools we have to make a difference. And by using all the different ways of knowing, we're able to start looking at really challenging multidimensional issues like water and hopefully inspiring people to care and hopefully working towards solutions, solutions that are community-based, culturally-based, and I'm um, scientifically based. And none have to be mutually exclusive of the other. Mm -hmm. Questions? Everybody's good. They're going to be a test year later because we're from the university. Well, <laughs> <laughs> right. 
Um, some of the things that we found in communities, and, and um, I'll lead up to this blessing that I'll say, is uh, some of the things we found in the communities were that uh, Native people have uh, an approach to gatherings, you know, where we're gathering on a good thing, on a good way, and um, we want to clear some of the air that everybody's here in peace. You know, we're here to do a good thing for the future. And so they generally will do um, a, a blessing or a prayer to start a gathering like this. And um, some of the things we found in our travels is that some people burn sweet grass or cedar or sage or different things. And, and it, uh, it's not ours to come into a community and decide what is appropriate and what isn't. You know, we're just coming from our heart and saying a prayer. So um, I won't burn those, those things today. Uh, because uh, we're all coming in on different paths. Uh, we're coming in here from different backgrounds and different uh, educational values and your religious values, and those are your private things. Uh, we as Native people, uh, we honor those things and try not to challenge them in, in you, but at the same rate, uh, try to awaken things, new things to you. And. Um, so when we go into the communities, we'll always ask an elder to do a blessing. Now, uh, it's always funny because uh, in our group, I'm the elder, because I'm the <laughs> oldest one. And, um, and I, I, I've now been uh, identified uh, at my tribe at Crow as a young elder. Yes, which <laughs> means we don't have to bring him food for another 30 years. <laughs> so I, can, I, can, I, can, I have a little bit of that authority as an elder, but not much, just a little one. And um, so it's funny about the communities that we go into and, and how, uh, how it works. Mm -hmm. And um, what we are actually going to do today is we're going to exchange ideas. And, and throughout your day and throughout your weekend, you're going to exchange ideas. And then you're going to take that information out into the world and you're going to feed other people about what you learned today. And um, our project is about water and how it nourishes you. And information is very similar to water. Because what you're going to do is you're going to nourish people with the things that you think are important. You know, because those are the things that you're going to have listened to. Those are the things that are going to have been working on in your mind and how you're going to develop those things. And so what we want to do is ask for a blessing that all of those ideas work on you. And that everything you hear Day and tomorrow and through the weekend um, begins to grow you know, because of what's inside of you is the nourishing water. Your love is the water that will nourish the information that you will feed others. Okay? First maker of all things, we pray unto you for you listen to us. We are in this time of the full moon of changing leaves. We are watching all of the love of the summer come to the ground and prepare for the spring ahead of the storms of winter. We pray that the people are ready, that food is there for them, and that the animals are, are well taken care of through these months. We pray thank you for the warmth of the sun of the summer and the water you gave us from the sky to the earth and to the lakes that fed the rivers and increased their volume so that we can drink. First maker of all things, we pray unto you for our children in the future, those who haven't come. We pray that there will be clean water and good earth for them for all time that what we are as caretakers and shepherds of this time will be remembered as people who cared and loved the future as well as the past. First maker of all, we pray for you to watch over our elders as they come into these harder times of life in the winter, that some of the youth will come and help them remove the snow and, and get the wood and help them 
so that life isn't so hard. First maker of all things, we pray for the people who are the, the pioneers of this planet, that in the tears that will fall about what has come, will come nourishing plants of wisdom for them to find a togetherness and a bond that will, will educate and heal the past. We pray that these people that have come to this event be blessed and their families be blessed with good things to come, that the sun shines always on them, even on the rainy day, and that peace is in their hearts and in their happiness for all times. That was easy. That was Everybody easy. still here? <laughs> Good. So those are sort of the things, you know, we think about and we try to remember as, you know, as we're going to go through this today, um, some of the things that we uh, have come into knowledge about are um, is how Native people uh, teach their youth, you know, how we, we teach people about this planet. You know, there's this really strange idea that once uh, European education thought that uh, the planet was flat, you know? It was flat, and they taught themselves that. And everybody got all excited about the world's flat. And then all of a sudden they realized the world is uh, round. Well, the native people never thought the world was round. It has mountains, and it has valleys. It's, it has character. You know, it's, it's, it changes. Or a mountain could be a flood could take it away. You know, we, we know that the world is in change. And never say that the world is this, because tomorrow it could be that. You know, we looked at Isabella come in and just do that to the whole eastern seaboard, right? We, we never had an idea in June that the seaboard would be changed in the way that Isabella changed it. We thought things would stay there for a long time. And, and nature doesn't do that. Nature is, is, is inertia in, in the best form, you know, and what we've created is that resistance. So in the world of what we see as nature, um, once you put a label on nature, then it's going to change. As, us, as we, as kids, you know, we go to our homes where we were kids, you know, we used to play in the cornfields, uh, me and Billy. No, there's no cornfield there now. The water still rains on there, but there's no cornfield. I go down to see where my school was, and my school is just empty now. It's gone, basically. It's hollow. There's no voices there. So what do you do about that? You know, you move on. You just learn to let go, and you move on. And you think, God, I, bet I wish I'd have really spent every day of my life in that cornfield. I wished I hadn't have gone to that roller skating rink or bowling or something, you know. I wish I'd have just sat in that cornfield. Now it's gone. The bowling alley's still there. <laughs> but water is a changing thing. Water is going to evolve. Water takes uh, any form it wants. And uh, about the time you think it's uh, solid, it melts. You know, about the time that you think it's, it's liquid, it evaporates. You know, it's always changing. It does exactly what the environment asks of it. And so uh, what we have are some ideas and some activities. Bonnie's got some things laid out. I'm anxious to see what this is going to be. And so I'll let her take over, and then we'll go back and forth. Okay? Sounds exciting. And if anybody has questions, don't forget to. We have plenty of time. I don't know if anybody needs a watch here, but there are them in the room. <laughs> Yeah, let's do that. <laughs> <laughs> I'd much rather look out that way, though. So to start today, we'd love to know who's in the room. And I've got a series of questions in this bag. I'm going to pass it around and just pick one, anyone, doesn't matter. And then pick a picture that matches your question. And then we're going to ask you to share your question in the picture. So would anybody like to start, share their picture, share their question? I'll go. Great. I'm not sure I understand the question. Okay. <laughs> okay. It says, find a photograph that seems to call you. Ask the work, what do you have to tell me about my life? What does the work tell you? 
Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they probably all say the same thing. Ah, okay. This picture I picked it because to me the buffalo is strength and his power. He's strong. He's got a warm coat for the winter. And uh, he's just a very special animal to me. And I don't like the snowmobiles in the background. <laughs> <laughs> They're invading his territory. But um, about my life, I never saw a buffalo until I was grown and married. A real live buffalo. And I lived in Oklahoma all my life. And the first one I saw was about 20 miles from my home. But it was in the country. And there was a big buffalo wallow there that used to be, you know, used to be a buffalo wallow. And sure enough, somebody had bought a pair of buffaloes and put mm -hmm. them there. And I thought that was the greatest thing it ever was. Mm -hmm. So when we go over to the little town, um, that was on the other side of the buffalo. I'd always watch for the buffalo as we go by there. Uh, and I don't know how to tell you, uh, there's just a special thing with me and the buffalo, and I can't explain it. And also on the other side here, it looks like the Grand Canyon. And um, I've seen it now. I think I was about, um, 68 when I saw it for the first time. Read about it all my life. And now, um, all of these things tell me that, that I am, I like to think on the right road because I've seen 76 winters and I don't care who knows it. <laughs> and, um, and I find every day Honestly, this is from my heart. I find every day a new adventure. And every time I make a move, which has been quite often in the last four or five years, it's a new adventure. Sometimes I'm splashed in different cultures, like from a warm goldfish bowl to the cold Atlantic, you know. But I just, because I want to, and I love, I just, I just love living, living life. But now what my work is, I don't know. Uh, I do write some, but I write a humorous column of all things for a paper back home, and it's really down home writing, you know. So, but I write a lot on the side that I never publish. And the buffalo has always, uh, well, just meant strength. And when the white buffalo were born, mm -hmm. I got mm -hmm. so excited, I, and I want to see those. That's my next thing I'd like to do. I could go on all day, I'm sorry. Right. <laughs> this is a wonderful version. Thank you so much. Thank you. Somebody else like to share their picture and their question? Oh, you got to come in and pick it up. Come on in. you got to get a question in. <laughs> oh, here we go. Yep, there's a, here you go. You need this question? Okay. And just pick a picture. Oh, there's a question. Make sure that goes with the question. So read the question. Oh, 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 oh. I gotcha. I'll bet she did. And meanwhile, we'll let Faith go. So I just have to rummage. Well, oddly, mine says, I'm going to have to keep on moving. And what does that work tell you about your own life? Somebody there might have had the right clue. I picked the one of this fellow. Oh, my. Flying over here. What hit me at first was I saw several photographs that I was drawn to because they reminded me about things I've done and places I've been, adventures I've had, things that are dear to me. Um, and I saw this, and this is something I've always thought about doing, but haven't ever done. And the way that correlates to my own life right now is I'm in a major transition, and I am reaching out into things I've never done. And um, um, this kind of reminds me of that spirit of adventure that I've had that has blessed my life to take it in, in many different and, and exciting ways. And um, I'm 
connecting with that <coughs> in such a, such a new way. It's, it's like right now, it's like I'm jumping off a cliff in my life. Uh, so that's what inspired me to take this because it's the unknown. <laughs> it's a wonderful thing. It's a wonderful thing. Does anybody else feel comfortable sharing a question? Yeah, no, I should go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not I'll share this. I have a different question. Great. It's find a photograph that gives you clues about the artist's personality, values, or feelings. How are they communicated in the work? And I was immediately attracted to this picture of this. What is it? Is it a str Virga or it's a, a weather phenomenon in the ocean? Uh, or else, or is there, it, uh, it, it's, it's a mystery, I don't, do you, any of you know if this is Virga, you know, which is suspended rain, but no, it isn't suspended because it, what? I was thinking of well, a whale with a lot of power. <laughs> well, I, I, I thought of that too, and there is a, t a tiny object right down here, but it's... Yeah, but there's no way. It's, no, it's, it's too small <laughs> an object to, to cause this. And uh, so, uh, uh, well, first of all, I was just attracted to this right at the beginning because it was strange and a little, maybe a little ominous, but um, it's, well, well, I'll finish saying it because I started. Because I'm, instead of saying what the uh, uh, artist's personality, values, or feelings are, I'm telling you about mine. But it's, I, I guess it speaks to me of spirit and God. The, the light behind and the darkness in the front. And looking at it um, and considering the artist, the first thing I think of is that the artist had to have been uh, very much connected with uh, nature and the ocean and very patient. Can you imagine how much time it would take to be able to uh, witness and photograph an object like this? Uh, but then uh, also, I feel connected with the artist because, because I was so attracted to it to begin with. Uh, and and it, it uh, seems obvious to me that it is ocean. And ocean is such a symbol. It's, it can be a, uh, it's a symbol of depth and uh, it, uh, it can be terrorizing. The ocean uh, can be threatening or terrorizing, but it also is can be beautiful. And after you talked, is it? Uh, I can't quite see your name. Virgie. Virgie. Mm -hmm. Okay. Virgie. After you turned your picture over, I thought, oh. I wonder what's on the other side of this picture. So I turned it over, and here is another scene of water, and it looks more like a lake. And uh, what immediately comes to me is that the lake mirrors the sky. So it's so uh, the artist's personality. Again, this artist had to be, a, 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 again, a person who uh, is very connected with nature and has the patience and the eye to see what was in this photograph. And there's something in it that speaks to me of infinity, because, you know, mirrors and mirrors and mirrors. And and they're both black and white pictures, so there's an absence of color. So that speaks to me of what? Reducing something to its essence, stripping it. 
That's just what comes to me. So. Thank you so much. Anybody else? I'd like to go. Oh, okay. I had the same um, question as, as you, Virgie. Mm -hmm. um, find a photograph that reminds you of something in your past. How does the work connect to your own experience? And I actually grabbed the photo before I, I didn't realize I was like worrying about the camera when you guys were talking, <laughs> talking about the directions. But this works out fine. Um, this, I just grabbed it because it's because of green and light and growth, and it reminds me of frogs and just you know like frogs' feet. <laughs> um, and frogs. You know, I'm from suburban New York, so <laughs> if there's been any animal that's followed me around, it's been frogs, you know. And um, like when I was in like fourth grade, I was in this like gifted program where I could like leave school for one day a week and it was like a whole program on frogs and we had to dissect frogs and really research them. <laughs> And at the time, you know, I wasn't an environmentalist or an animal rights person or anything. I really got into the dissection and really just learned everything about frogs and was fascinated by tadpoles turning into frogs and the way they lay their eggs. And um, I don't know, I just, I like the look of them or the sound of them. And um, yeah, and so how does it, I mean, Right now, I'm, um, you know, I just moved in to a friend's house, um, and he's a, like a Zen priest, and um, we have a little temple in our house called the Laughing Frog Temple, you know, he named it, and I just ended up there. And um, it was great, I was like, this is perfect, and it's really cheap rent, you know. And um, so, um, we've been working a lot, we do, um, like mantras, and we have a whole sequence of mantras. He's studied um, Tibetan Buddhism and Zen Buddhism, and I've studied, if any religion, I've studied Tibetan Buddhism the most. And um, so we work with certain deities and um, vis like visualizing light and color um, for healing, you know. And green is. Um, you know, for, there's a there's a, a deity named Tara, um, who's sort of the intermediary between um, um, compassion or um, Shinrazig and um, just people, and it's it's the tears of of the de of the deity of compassion or the Taras, and there's different kinds of tears, and the green one is um, to give people um, a sense of just life and like that power of, of plants, you know. And um, I've had, I've been sick for a while, so I've been working on that one <laughs> a lot. And, um, and then on the other side, I guess we'll do that too, are the turkeys, like wild turkeys. And one of them is like kind of just real docile and the other one is real aggressive and how does this remind me of my past? It has nothing to do with my past at all. It's, I, mean, wild, I didn't even know wild turkeys existed for like a long time. That's how sheltered I was. And uh, I mean, I you know grew up going to Thanksgiving dinners in Brooklyn, you know, and not really buying into the Pilgrims and Indians thing or anything, but just having zero zero culture. I mean, you know. Zero history, really. Um, just everything was just about food and family. And so, yeah. <laughs> That's about all I can think of. <laughs> Anybody else like to share the picture? Okay. Okay, all right. Um, similar question. Find a photograph that seems to call to you. Ask the work, what do you have to tell me about my life? What does the work you. I immediately went to this one, and I think it's sort of symbolic of really how my life has kind of come at this stage. 
Um, I've always looked at water and underneath the surface as being really important. And I find that that's where my, I'm drawn all the time. In my work with students, in my work as a therapist, I'm continually looking below the surface. And I'm just always struck by the stories that come out and the wisdom that comes out that we always look at the external so much and make such an emphasis on, on looks and beauty and jobs and all that sort of thing. But the realness comes from the stories. And when you were saying that you really interviewed the elders to get their perception, I think we, we don't take the time enough to really tap into the wisdom of all of us that we really have the answers. And so part of this whole idea of looking below the surface and you know, kind of gaining a sense of spirituality and what's below the surface has really been my sort of mission in the last couple of years. So that's what spoke to me. Thank you. I'll go. Says, um, <clears throat> find a photograph that is most like you. What similarities do you find between the work and yourself? Excuse and, uh, me, I'm hard of hearing. Would you be willing to speak up on Certainly. Find a photograph that is most like you. What similarities do you find between the work and yourself? Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. Yeah, um, just one word came to me when I saw this was effervescent, and I thought of joy and like a burst of energy, life. I like to enjoy life. I like to um, enjoy the moment. I think it speaks of my, of an aspect of my personality, which I've been told that, you know, I tend to be effervescent and have a little fun <laughs> part to me. So, really, it's not really deep and profound, but that's what really hit me. And when she thought about the, you know, the color, I thought, hmm, I never thought of, she thought she spoke about black and white and she spoke about color and the impact of green to her. Well, in my religion, blue is, um, this speaks in the Christian religion, blue is a significant color. So when she spoke of that, um, that came to me that I could add that to sound profound, but I never actually thought of it originally either. <laughs> but blue means um, the grace of God. Um, you know, blue, the, the color blue represents the grace of God, but I just thought, life. That's what this, um, this means to me, I think. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's the one word I have, effervescent. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, thank you. Can I go? Yes. Um, my name's Abby, by the way. Um, find a photograph that is most like you. What similarities do you find between the work and yourself? <clears throat> I kind of rummaged through, but um, it's a picture of, I guess, fall leaves and water. And... Um, I guess it's most like me because I come from um, Michigan. That's where I was born and raised. And um, right now, especially, I'm I'm kind of homesick because that's my favorite season is the fall oh, and the colors. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, and the water. I grew up um, in the pinky of Michigan, and the water is very important to me. So at the same time, I love to write and um, and what energizes me to write is a lot of where I come from and my memories and the nostalgia I feel and um, the water that has shaped me and um, and now I'm in the process of <coughs> applying to women's um, writing retreat, retreats, and then one's in Minnesota, because I long to go back that way at that time, and, you know, I've, I've applied for a month, you know, just to immerse myself in um, what I am not finding time to do in my daily life, and um, I, it just is, it just connects with me that way, so. Ah, sure, I have the all too common and 
you know, enjoyable question of <laughs> uh, this photograph that reminds you of something in your past and how does it connect to your own experience. And I selected this, being a very lucky child. I grew up in the Tobacco Mountains and at the base of Ross Peak. Um, my dad is the, rural, the nation's rural education advisor, so I lived in a lot of little towns. Um, and this was a scene that I'm very used to. This was uh, my television. Uh, and so silence and the imagination was my entertainment. <clears throat> Interestingly enough, blue, uh, spiritually speaking, is, is very wonderful, as is the stone lapis, uh, which has followed me, been given to me, showed up on, it's just my whole life is like that. <laughs> I even have baby jewelry with it. So there's a spiritual essence to this and the silence. There's also a little set of footprints right there. In other words, someone has walked very lightly and with a lot of effort and care. And one of the things I thought about when I saw this is how many avalanches I've been able to witness without causing them. <laughs> Summer, fall, any time of year. <clears throat> and it's just an, an inch, because you can feel it before it happens. And you just sit silently and the mountain comes down. It's wonderful. So then I resisted turning my paper over. <laughs> I was going to be real cool because I felt some trepidation with turning my picture over because I had not looked. But until Abby started to speak, I didn't. Now this is going to shock you guys. So we have winter <clears throat> and a dead animal. How does this relate to my current experiences? Uh, without any um, maybe formal training, I have several college degrees, but without formal training, I've become the spiritual stronghold for anybody who's died and um, for the people to feel joy in the passing and um, to understand that the one sure thing about life is death and uh, how beautiful that can be and how it contributes. So when I turned this over, I freaked out and went, this is rather appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> a photograph that reminds you of something in your past. How does the work connect to your own experience? I saw from here, I saw this, this sunset over the water, and I've just always loved seeing sunset over the water. And I'm assuming it's sunset, because that's where I see this over the water. I don't see the sunrise over the water, but this is this, this on the east coast. This could be sunrise. But I was, so I just grabbed it because I love the way that that creates the path. Kind of feels like illuminating the pathway back to the source of light and warmth and love, as, you know, grandfather, son, or however we interpret our relationship with the sun, the life giving sun. And to me, I, I haven't, I have some friends that are very, fire oriented, I'm very water oriented, and for me, it's much easier for me to relate to the sun as reflected on the water. And, and to me, it gives me this gentler, or something I can relate to more, because I know the ocean is, as you're saying, could be terrifying, you know, it's the water, I could say it's gentle, but it could be anything but gentle, too. Um, it helps me to connect to fire. And and but I was very surprised when I saw that it's ice, it's snow, it's glacial. Um, and how that uh, connects to my experience is um, I've been away from my spiritual practice as I knew it um, for the last few years. And I am um, just now going back to it. My life just kind of took me away from it and I'm coming back to it. And I, I've never liked winter, and I can't stand cold. Um, I, I have a hard time keeping warm. It's not, it's not home for me. But there's the fire, you know. I was like, should maybe just make friends with the fire more. <laughs> but it's, I think, how this reflects on my experience is that this pathway to the divine is kind of frozen. You know, it's a, a lot of this area is not reflecting the light because I haven't been reflecting the light. I haven't been paying attention to my spiritual path as much as I used to. I used to be first and foremost and last and everything in between <laughs> was all I cared about and everything else was just getting in the way. 
And then it was like, all oh, right, I have to figure out how to make money. <laughs> Most things. Anyway, um, <laughs> which I don't want to forget to mention that I'm a singer. My name is Jules Graves. I came here to sing, and I'm singing tonight. At, um, there's music starting at 7.30 in the... Emerson. In the theater. What's it called? Emerson Theater. In the Emerson, Emerson. Theater. And, um, and so much of what each one of you have said is like, oh, I have a song about this. Oh, wait. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I was just like, I have a song about that. Oh, <laughs> so then I turned it over. And um, this is hilarious, absolutely hilarious. This buck has a grass headdress, is the way the caption says it. It's full of all of this grass. It's, <laughs> it's, it's totally hilarious. And the reason it's hilarious is because, well, I have a new cabin that I'm renting, and I'm just meeting the other people and on the land. And this guy, Scott, came up to me and he goes, another really big hat on your head. He said, I see how you are. You wear really big hats, don't you? <laughs> and I was like, it's cold. <laughs> but my hats are like, I'll wear one of them tonight. I mean, it's huge and it's green and it looks like a leprechaun would wear it. And then it has a whole bunch of silly buttons on it. And I've always worn ridiculous hats. And I'm like, oh, this buck with this huge bunch of grass on its head. And it looks like me. <laughs> it's so, me. so I don't know what else to say other than. You know, yo, homeboy, what's up? <laughs> I, I don't know what you're talking about. I feel that way. I don't get it. You know? So, anyway, so thanks for inspiring us all to turn it over and, and <laughs> on the other side. So, thank you. That's good. That's big. Um, mine was um, find a photograph that calls you, ask the work, what do you have to tell me about my life, and what does the work tell you? Well, I. I saw these landscapes, and I'm I'm sort of a, an artist who loves I'm a I paint and I love landscapes. So I started to go to the landscape, and then I went oh, when I saw this because it reminded me of a huge time in my life when I was about 10 years old, and uh, my father and mother took us to the San, to Sanibel Island in Florida, and to the uh, Penny Camp Park, which is this great snorkeling place, and. We went out in this boat for hours and hours, it seemed. And then we get out in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of the ocean. And I've never been to the ocean, because I was from Iowa, and I was from the Midwest. I'd never seen this much water in my life. And I was terrified. And my father was really excited, and he said, he said, I'll go first. And he has his flippers on, and he jumps in with his snorkel, his mask, and I'm like, there goes my dad. And I was really, I was really scared. And, 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 he, and then he comes, and then he's got his head down for a long time, and he doesn't come up, you know? And so finally he comes up, and he says, Sarah, you've got to come down here. It's great. So, you know, with that, give, you know, giving me that permission, you know, I, I slowly got in, and, I, and when, I, when I got to this point where I could look down and see the world below me, I mean, I was just completely blown away. I still think that was one of the things in my life that made me an artist because I just, I just said, ah, oh, it's beautiful, you know, it's, it's so amazing. And so how this describes my life right now is that I'm starting this new process of, of being a professor at the university and teaching art and, and running a new program. And so I feel like I'm just at that place at the surface of the water and I'm about to jump in. And look at a whole other picture of what it's going to be like, and I'm just really excited. So, cool. That's it. It's my turn. Okay. Well, my question was the same as yours. Find a photograph that seems to call you. And this photograph right here was jumped out of the pile at me. It's a picture of a backcountry skier, and uh, I've recently gotten into backcountry skiing. It's my, it's my passion. It's my love. I live for it. Um, everything about it. I just love walking out in the mountains uh, in just pristine wilderness and just being one with it. It's it's really fabulous. And um, the rest of the thing is ask the work, what do you have to tell me about my life? Well, this guy right here is uh, walking around the mountains and he seems to be exploring the terrain below. And uh, I think that's a good metaphor. It tells me that I need to keep on exploring in my life, not only in the hills, but in every aspect, and, and continue to broaden my horizons. Um, and of course, I flip mine over as well. 
and there's a picture of a big mountain on the other side, and I, I love mountains as well. I think they're just fascinating. Um, and, you know, since we're talking about spirituality, I don't know if I find anything more spiritual than sitting on top of a mountain that I've just climbed. Um, it's really, it's really something else. So, um, yeah, I guess that's all I have to say. Who else? Anybody? I chose this picture because I saw the rainbow, and the rainbow has great meaning to me because it's the, the light that shines through after the storm, and um, I, I just, um, and also because I feel like that the earth is kind of in a storm, or has been in a tough time, and the, the light's coming through, and um, and is giving us hope for a new future. And um, something that I connected with, um, with Black Elk speak, he speaks, he talks of the rainbow people, of all the people of the earth coming together, and um, the rainbow tribe, that the diversity, diverse peoples will come, and um, that will be a global community. Kind of what I feel like is happening here and now. And I almost didn't want to take this picture because of the agriculture that's below it, because I, it bothers me what, how we alter the land so much that um, the Native peoples practiced agriculture, but they do it more in harmony with the land and, and tend the raspberries that were already there and, and keep things more the same, that we tend to kill everything else so that we can grow one thing. and. Um, and that, but I just thought, I, I still, the rainbow is what I, it's just been my guiding force, kind of. So I took that and forgot to read this, that uh, find a photograph that is most like you, what similarities do you find between the work and yourself? And I've kind of, I think I've already explained that, but um, I guess that's about it. Well, mine was find a photograph that you'll find moving, and what does the work tell you about your own life? So I I took this one. Um, this is, was moving. It's the um, and it's a place I've never been. Um, I I've never been to one of these kind of places, palm trees and such. And um, my wife would like to go there, but uh, <laughs> I've always been in Montana. So um, what to tell you about this is. About my life, this is probably where I might end up. I have a question. Find a photograph that seems to call you. Ask the work, what do you have to tell me about my life? Uh, this is a mountain image, and um, since I have been 18, I've been very, very attracted to the mountains. and. Um, made a commitment in the mountains at 18 that I was going to devote my life to public service. So every day that I'm out and can see anything that looks like a mountain, it reminds me of my work and what I have to do that day. So um, that is that image. And I just want to thank you so much for all sharing your questions. There's actually seven of them. It's interesting that they didn't all come up. But this is an activity that's grounded in adult education principles. It's grounded in getting people into the affected domain and um, providing some open space to talk. And one of the things that um, I like to do is open with an activity like this, because if we're gonna be in a class, and whether we're talking about science, culture, or spirit, part of this is finding some common ground. And the activity um, piece of going back and returning things is fundamental to the native traditions of understanding that everything has a place, everything has a home and we're to borrow things and learn from them for a while, but then to take things back. And how many of you ever did a science activity in school where you brought things inside, you classified them, you killed them, and then you just left it on the back counter? Mm -hmm. Anybody do that? It's, that's it's, what we were speaking of. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And so this is about making small changes in the way we teach to share our values for all living things and to demonstrate that all things are connected. And um, we so much appreciate you coming today. We have lots and lots to share with you. And I want to um, encourage you, please stay in touch with me if you'd like to go into this in more depth. We actually have a draft curriculum that goes into um, this in lots more depth.
and um, it's something that we're going to be working on some more this winter and going back to. But um, this piece that you have in your hands is just a little introduction. It's also on our website, and we're glad to give you more kids' books if you have children to take them to okay. about um, introducing science and spirit in safe ways. And thank you again for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.